Good evening. My name is Keith Cole, and I'm the executive director for the Wolf River Conservancy. I want to welcome you all here tonight for our first virtual lecture for 2023. It is part of our ongoing environmental education outreach to the community. And we're very excited about tonight's program where we'll learn more about the history and ecology of the T.O. Fuller State Park from Tennessee State Park Ranger to Kona Muller. Tonight's lecture is not only our first for 2023, but it marks the beginning of this year's Wolf River Restoration Series. The Wolf River Restoration Series is a series of activities beginning with tonight's lecture and concluding on Earth Day of this year, April 22nd. They consist of both physical and virtual activities, but all designed to raise the awareness and illustrate the importance of the conservation work of the Wolf River Conservancy. The first project of this year's series will be this coming Monday, Martin Luther King Day, where we will host a day of service at the Kennedy Park segment of the Wolf River Greenway Trail. We will begin at 10 o'clock in the morning. We will end at noon. We have a variety of activities. And to learn more about this coming weekend's activities and all the activities at the Wolf River Conservancy, we invite you to visit wolfriver.org. Most importantly, we'd like to share with you that we're pleased to announce that Brother International is returning as our presenting sponsor for this year's Wolf River Restoration Series. And we appreciate Brother's generous support. And we know that they are an environmentally conscious corporate citizen in our community. Along with that, they encourage their employees to come out, uh, such as this coming Martin Luther King Day, to participate in our day of service. So we appreciate Brother not only for their financial support, but for their volunteer efforts as well. And we'd like to take this time to also acknowledge all of our benefactors for 2023. They would include Buckman, Crawford Howard, Private Family Foundation, AutoZone, FedEx, Hyde Family Foundation, International Paper, Jim Kara Subaru, Ring Container Technologies, and Silvamo for their generous support that helps us throughout the year in a variety of ways. But of course, all of our supporters, Corporations, as well as individual donors and volunteers, are critically important to allowing the Wolf River Conservancy to deliver on our mission each day of the year. And we appreciate you all and thank you all. And of course, if you'd like to make a financial gift during tonight's lecture, uh, there will be a, a, a link in the chat box that allows you to do that safely and security. secure. Some housekeeping details. We ask that you not record tonight's lecture. We're actually recording it ourselves. And if you've registered for tonight, you'll, you'll receive a link uh, within the next five to seven days that will allow you to access tonight's lecture again, to watch again, or to share with other friends. During the evening, also, if you have questions, please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom uh, uh, application here. Kathy Justice, our Director of Education, will be monitoring those questions and she will ask those of uh, Dakota at the end of tonight's lecture. So let me introduce to you uh, State Park Ranger Dakota Muller. Uh, he has been a State Park Ranger since 2019. He first started working at the State Park in 2016. He has a Bachelor of Degree uh, of Science in Biology. And we're very happy to have him here tonight to share with us more about T.O. State Fuller Park and why it's important to our community, not only from a historical standpoint, but from an ecological standpoint. Dakota, welcome. Well, hello, and thank you, Keith. Uh, let me get this straightened up. Yes, so hello, everybody. I am Dakota Muller, Ranger with T.O. Fuller State Park. Uh, and I'm actually about to just go ahead and get started into this thing because I got a lot to cover and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Here we go. Let me get this started. Hey. All right. So this is my contact information. Of course, uh, I am a ranger, um, officially a ranger too. Uh, my email address is on here. You can email me for any reason. Um, and of course, uh, at the end of this, I will inform you of the things that we have available. Uh, that phone number is to our visitor center and you can call them for any reason. You can leave uh, a message for anybody at the park, uh, including myself. So the history of Teal Fuller is very 
Interesting. Uh, of course, it is named after Dr. Thomas Oscar Fuller, uh, a gentleman who was a an activist, uh, a civil leader, uh, a Baptist minister, an educator, um, a, a politician. He did many things. So Dr. Fuller was the son of J. Henderson Fuller and Miss Mary Eliza Fuller. Both of them were uh, actually slaves in North Carolina plantations. Um, now, Mr. Fuller is what I want to call him, J. Henderson, Dr. Fuller's father. He was able to actually have a a business, really, um, a, a, another place of employment off of the plantation. Now, most slaves at this point would take something such as an apprenticeship, maybe blacksmithing, um, carpentry, which is what Mr. Fuller did. However, he owned his own business, which was rare. Uh, I mean, he built uh, everything, even houses. With the money that he earned, he was able to purchase his own freedom before the Emancipation Proclamation was signed and the freedom of his wife. But of course, that is not what defines him because Mr. Fuller was able to, uh, he was taught to read um, and he taught his wife, Mary Eliza Fuller to read, who then instilled the importance of education into all of their children. Uh, Dr. Fuller himself took it and ran with it. He became an educator himself. Um, so their family really defined themselves by their appreciation for education and progression. Uh, of course, Dr. Fuller's early accomplishments, he got his bachelor's at Shaw University at age 23, got his master's at Shaw University at age 26. Uh, he became a Baptist minister. Uh, once he got his master's, he became an educator. And through his works, he gained... Um, I guess he became semi-famous. Uh, he was well known in the area, and he was the first African American to be elected into the state senate of North Carolina in 1838. Now I have this picture here. It's called Wilmington's Lie, and or, well, rather 1898. I have this picture here called Wilmington's Lie. It's a book written by David Zucchino. Um, now I have not read this book myself, but it is on its way to my house because I am going to read this book. Um, of course, I was aware of the Wilmington Insurrection, which is what it was called. That occurred in 19, I'm sorry, 1898. Uh, it was in response to a Black-owned newspaper that would not stop printing what folks did not want it to print. And of course, when Dr. Fuller, or at this time, Mr. Fuller, because he had not got his doctorate, he got elected into the state senate, and they apparently couldn't handle it anymore. Um, from what I was able to read online. It was a group of 500 white men that descended upon Wilmington, burned down the uh, Black-owned newspaper. A lot of lives were lost. It was um, a horrible event, um, but I was corrected by a couple of folks that I was given this program to. Uh, they told me that I should read Wilmington's Lie. Of course, these two folks did not know each other, and they told, and I learned about this one individual told me too much prior to the other individual. Um, so I now have to read it and I'm very excited to do so. And if y'all enjoy reading historical books, I would recommend doing it as well. Um, so Dr. Fuller in 1898, uh, he fought, uh, you know, of course, blatant and systemic racism all the way to 1900, where he got kicked out of his uh, state Senate spot due to uh, disenfranchisement or disfranchisement is what it's called. Uh, of course, that took power away by essentially lessening what a African-American or a black male or individual uh, could do as far as voting. So he got kicked out of the seat. Uh, and in 1900, he got a call to be a Baptist minister at the First Colored Baptist Church on Beale uh, here in Memphis. So he maintained that role for a couple years before he started, you know, expanding the roles and he expanded it. And we're about to see everything he did. Uh, in 1902, he became the acting principal of a place called Howe Institute. Uh, later on, Howe Institute would be the precursor to Lemoyne Owen College uh, or Lemoyne Owen University. 
Um, and he was the acting or temporary principal for about 27 years. And he, he took it to new heights from where he started at. Um, of course, he was a conservative individual. Um, he, he was more accommodating um, than the, uh, I guess, more progressively activist uh, African-Americans. Um, a lot of folks, he did not gain a lot of favor um, in the more progressive crowds. So that actually changed in 1917 with the lynching and subsequent burning of L.C. Parsons. It was witnessed by uh, over, I remember correctly, over 800 individuals uh, in public, you know, publicly done, of course, and that changed his views. Uh, it's the very next month, that was May of 19. 17 in june he joined well i guess the first chapter of the naacp in memphis uh three years later he became a or played a prominent role in the setting up of the commission of interracial cooperation in memphis they did several things now of course the cic or the commission of interracial cooperation was something that um kind of resulted from the extreme racial violence that started occurring after World War I. Of course, a modern um, event that you can kind of uh, equate this to is when 9-11 happened. Of course, it seemed everybody in, in the United States had become kind of uh, working together. They started working together a little bit more, agreeing a little bit more, uh, but you would see the persecution of Middle Easterners or folks of Middle Eastern heritage. This was something once the war ended and people stopped having that common commonality, um, uh, just racial violence started to happen everywhere. So the CIC was something that formed uh, in response to that. One of the things they did, and I will circle back to this, is Booker T. Washington High School. If anybody's familiar with it, the CIC is responsible in Memphis was responsible for changing its name from what was originally the Negro Industrial High School to Booker T. Washington High School. Now, of course, in Memphis, um, the, you know, locally, they referred to this particular chapter of CIC as the Memphis Interracial League. Um, now, they hired only blacks. This is significant because they hired about 1,200 or somewhere over 1,200 individuals. Um, which made it the largest uh, active activist group in uh, Tennessee. He, through all of this, his endeavors with the Memphis Interracial League, he gained the interest of Boss E. H. Crump, Edward Crump. Um, so Crump uh, decided he was going to try to use Dr. Fuller as um, kind of a voice for the uh, African-Americans. Uh, you know, if if he could get, uh, or if he would support publicly Dr. Fuller in his endeavors, then maybe he could swing the African-American vote to him. Well, he found out in 1931 that um, he was trying, while he was trying to improve upon how Institute, um, the, 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 you know, the school that he was in charge of, he was trying to expand it. Um, and through his connections with Crump, he attempted to get it expanded, um, I guess, liberally. He, he was trying to, to almost double its size in outreach. And of course, Crump said no. Uh, he refused to support him. Uh, and of course, Dr. Fuller uh, kind of tried to fight fight for it and ended up having to take a break in 1931. Now, starting 1931, he started writing. Uh, he already had one book that he called what I believe to be 20 Years in the Public Eye or something of that nature um, that reflected his life from 1890 to 1910, which would have included, of course, his rise to the state Senate and then the subsequent Wilmington insurrection and so on. So he wrote a few other books, uh, Pictorial History of the American Negro, History of Negro Baptists in Tennessee, Bridging the Racial Chasms, 
the story of the church life among Negroes in Memphis. Um, with these books and adding um, the book that he wrote before, he became one of the most published African-Americans um, well, period uh, at this time. So he, he continued, or rather, he continued to write up to about 1938. Uh, in 1939, he kind of got interrupted because something called the Foot Homes Project was established in Memphis, Tennessee, and that was kind of what started making Bill Street what it is today, um, kind of a, um, you know, tourist attraction or a local, local attraction. What it did, though, was it displaced 16 white families and about 440 black families um, and had made them move away from their homes and their businesses. And one of those was Dr. Fuller's uh, First Colored Baptist Church. Now, of course, recently I mentioned that he was one of the ones in, uh, responsible for um, changing Booker T. Washington's high school's name from what it was to what it is now. Uh, he ended up moving his church across the street from Booker T. Washington High School, which is now a historical building there. Um, and it was called First Lauderdale Baptist Church. Now, in 1942, T.O. Fuller State Park was named after him. Or rather, I should say Shelby Negro Forest State Park was named after Dr. Thomas Oscar Fuller. Uh, and he passed away about nine days after that. So <laughs> I'm going to talk about. Boxtown real quick. This is, Boxtown is a community that, that is adjacent to and kind of runs through T.O. Fuller State Park even today. Um, of course, it was called Boxtown because at some point, the city of Memphis donated uh, a bunch of boxcars. Of course, boxcars used to be made out of wood, but we're not entirely sure if they were wooden or not. Uh, that were donated, but they would donate boxcars. Of course, this saved the city money so that they did not have to dispose of them correctly, which would have costed money. So they donated these and allowed the folks in Boxtown to live in them, which is how it got its name. Now, the history of Boxtown, though, is the first freed slave settlement in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, in 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, um, Enoch Inslee owned a lot of plantations and slaves right off of what is now called Riverport Road, which is also adjacent to the park. Uh, right off of his property, what eventually became known as Boxtown, when the slaves were free, they moved right off of there and they lived there in that community. Uh, so it is the first freed slave settlement. Dr. Fuller, when he got here, saw that they were living in boxcars. Uh, one of the things he would do is um, since his father was a carpenter and he was also a carpenter, uh, he actually would hold um, kind of like a trade school for folks and teach them carpentry and allow them to actually get a job to um, buy a house or build their own houses. So he is Dr. Fuller and T.O. Fuller State Park are both tied into Boxtown. Now, of course, park history. So Tennessee State Parks was created as an organization in 1937. Uh, the first three state parks, which were Harrison Bay, South Cumberland, and Shelby Negro Forest, uh, were created in 1938. The group that created this park in 1938 was a Black CCC, or Civilian Conservation Corps. So the Civilian Conservation Corps was a, a national governmental organization that was created in response to the Great Depression. Um, and what they would do is, of course, they did segregate um, their camps, but it is one of my favorite, historically, uh, governmental organizations or, or entities that they put together, uh, mainly because of everything they did. If you've never heard of the Civilian Conservation Corps, I implore you to just Google it. They did many, many things. Uh, and if it weren't for them, we might have not survived the Great Depression as we did. Um, now, of course, they would pay their individuals that were men ages 18 to 25 without a family of their own, as in they did not have wives and children. Um, they would get paid $25 a month 
And most of them would live off of $5 a month and send 20 back to wherever they were from to keep the farm, to keep the house, what, you know, to, for their family to live off of. Um, and the particular camp that was here, and whether they were white or black, they would still get paid $25 a month. The particular camp that built this park was a black CCC park. Of course, the renaming ceremony to from Shelby Negro Forest to T.O. Fuller State Park took place in 1942. That actually ties us into Meeman Shelby State Park, which is another state park in Shelby County. They were the white park in Shelby County. Um, of course, they were not a state park until 1944. So even though they did exist, they were a national park. They were the white park. And uh, the creation of Theo Fuller actually made it the, or rather, let me rephrase this, the creation of Shelby Negro Forest State Park made it the second park in the nation and first park east of the Mississippi open African American. Because of that historical fact, um, when desegregation of Tennessee State Parks really took effect, well, I won't say take effect, when they started it, when the, when the document was drawn up and they signed it, they signed it here at T.O. Fuller State Park in 1963. Of course, uh, all this document did was make it illegal to segregate state parks. Um, but as we all know, it took a while to actually implement it. Um, of course, it was probably later in the 70s until we we started becoming well known. Um, in fact, I, this is kind of cool to me. I've seen uh, a placemat from, um, what was it? It was Henry Horton State Park that has a golf course. I saw a placemat back from 19, I believe it was 58. It still said Shelby Negro Forest State Park, um, even though it was renamed T.O. Fuller State Park in 1942. Uh, so nothing really major um, as far as the creation or as, as additions to the park happened until really the late 1990s. Um, but uh, we did build the first major trail in the early 2000s. It started in the late 90s. It finished in the early 2000s. Uh, and that is now what is called our Discovery Loop. Of course, if you came here today, you would see that we have the Discovery Loop. It is four and a half miles. Um, in 2011, we used to have a golf course here. Uh, it 2011 was the year that it was officially uh, out of commission. And we started converting it to what is now the Wildlife Habitat Area. And in fact, if you look up, Wildlife Habitat Area, Memphis, in Google Maps, it would lead you right to the middle of the have Wildlife Habitat Area. Uh, it is now a, um, I guess, newly paved um, Natural Tennessee Grassland walking trail. Uh, and 2015, we updated our swimming pool. Um, we are reopening our swimming pool because of course after covid it it closed down but we did get an updated swimming pool in 2015 2017 the interpretive center opened in fact 2016 it was finished being built and that's how i actually came on to the park they hired me on as full-time as a clerk and i got to set it up so i'm very proud of the interpretive center and would happily show it to you myself if you decided to come by uh, and then of course our latest um endeavor that has been completed is our tires at trails where we collected 36,000 tires off the streets of Memphis. Uh, we shipped them to Bristol, Tennessee, ground them up, brought them back and repaved 2.9 miles of trails on that wildlife habitat area. Uh, here is the picture here of the trail. Um, this is our new trailhead. Uh, this is one of three entrances, entrances sorry, into this particular trail. So I've spoke of the Discovery Loop. I've spoke of the Wildlife Habitat Area. We have another completed trail that is called the Initiation Loop that was created by one of our partners, the Trail Trippers, uh, and it is two miles. So in total, we have about 10 miles of trails, give or take um, a fraction of a mile. So today, this is what I call our big brown sign. This is the brown sign that has every amenity that we have on the park. Um, today, we do have a campground. Of course, we have four rentable pavilions. Uh, we have um, 
the Native American area, Chuckalisa, which is run by University of Memphis. That uh, is in the middle of our property. However, uh, we do have our interpretive center that I spoke about, um, the swimming pool, and the Shelby Bluff Center is one of those four or five rather rentable pavilions. And I believe I'm going to go ahead and in this here, I tried to make this a little quicker. Again, here is my name and my email address. Feel free to email me if you have any requests. We do set up a lot of volunteer events. So if anybody's interested in coming outside and volunteering, um, then we have many opportunities. Uh, you can find some on our website it, um, on the T.R. Fuller webpage of the Tennessee State Park website, you can see our volunteer opportunities. Uh, of course, you can give us a call as well. So I am going to end this here and take questions. Let me stop. There we go. Okay, well, I'll start off uh, while people are thinking about possible questions. Let me start off asking you, Dakota, about the wildlife at the park. I think people might be interested in the wildlife and yes. ecology. So, yes, the wildlife at the park, we have um, everything you could think of in West Tennessee. So what we don't have is bears. Um, and the biggest animal we have is a deer. Our predators include, of course, coyotes and bobcats. Um, if you see a bobcat, it is awesome. They're absolutely great to see. They are absolutely terrified of everything they will run straight away and i've only seen them twice in my going on seven years here that's great and what else yeah good yeah. yeah we have uh, i mean we have everything we have uh, all the wildlife from or all the mammals you could think of uh, we got armadillos we got um, raccoons we got possums you'll see them all the time uh what you will see if you come through here later in the evening is we have a bunch of red-tailed hawks and barred owls that fly kind of near the um the road they like to perch on the power lines and the street signs um i'm i'm happy to say that we haven't had any of them um hit here but we do have three birds that we have in captivity because they have been injured uh we do programs with them we will do a program with them if anybody decides to come here and wants to see them up close um we do have a lot of snakes i'm i'm specifically mentioning snakes because um i have done snake finding hikes um most of the time we find water moccasins because they're the easiest ones to find but uh don't worry if you're interested in joining a snake finding hike we do not catch them we just locate. <laughs> well that's good um yeah. And do you find non-venomous snakes too? Uh, well, we don't find them as often. Uh, the most found non-venomous snake is um, the king snake here. Uh, we have the speckled king snake that lives here. That's my favorite snake. Um, and a lot of times I'm able to find the ringneck snake, which is one I will actually catch. Um, I have caught them and allowed folks to hold them there only about that long um so they don't get very big um but let's see we got those two and then finally we got the water viper the water viper is not um venomous uh but they're very easy to see because if you go to our wetlands and you bring up binoculars you will most likely see some swimming in the summer neat mm -hmm. okay here's another question that someone has asked are the trails open to both hikers and bikers so the wildlife habitat area is obviously um, open to bikers because it is a paved trail. Um, we have a trail that is being built right now, and the goal is to have it built so that mountain bikers can use it. Um, we do not have any that are specific to bikers. The one trail that I say that you definitely cannot take a bike on is the Discovery Loop because it does have several stairs um, and they are not <laughs> bike safe. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, and do you have any uh, like programs for like public programs and are they, would they be advertised on your website? 
Yes. So the website I mentioned before, if you if you just Google T.O. Fuller State Park, um, the first link that the first Tennessee State Park link that you see is our website. Uh, you can go to what's upcoming or what's called upcoming events, and that will tell you what programs we have. Uh, if you go to volunteer, that will tell you what volunteer opportunities we have. Most of our programs are free. Uh, in fact, we do have five signature hikes. The first one that we did this year was the first day hike, was the one we do every year on the 1st of January. Uh, the next one we have, I believe, would be the uh, spring hike, which is supposed to happen at the beginning of spring. Uh, you can find that information on there. Uh, in fact, we will have all of it up by the beginning of February. Okay, great. Okay, here are some more questions coming in. What forest type is predominant in the park? And would it be oak hickory or something else? So we have a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, a variation of trees. We do have a ton of oaks, though. Um, we have a lot of um, old growth. There wasn't a lot of, uh, let's see, cutting, rather, of forests in this area. Uh, of course, it was... Uh, predominantly an African-American area, as it is still today. So in the past, that means that there was not a lot of, um, you know, cutting down trees and expansion, right? So we, we do have a lot of old forests. Oh, great. Um, and someone is, someone says, hi, Dakota, awesome history. Thanks for doing this. And also, what is the status of the bridges on the loop trail? Uh, we have a ton of them, and we do have a number of them that are in need of repair. Uh, in fact, the first or the next volunteer event that we have is um, Martin Luther King Day, the 16th. Uh, and one of the, the thing that we will be doing is going to our bridge that needs the most help, uh, and we will be removing all of the obstruction that is under it that caused the bridge to shift. Uh, so, yes, we do have some bridges that are in need of care if anybody's interested of course that's another volunteer opportunity we do is we we build bridges uh, all of these bridges are hand built by either girl scouts or eagle scouts oh wow um, um another tree question how old do you think the oldest trees are teal fuller that's funny um because I'm, I'm actually, I've got the biggest and oldest trees I could find cord. Um, I'm working with the Overton Park Conservancy because they have uh, a tree guy. That's what I call him. Uh, and he has come and he has cor cored the largest oaks and some of the older pines that we have. Um, I haven't got those ages back yet, but uh, they're not. I was told that they're not as old as I thought they were. I thought we had a couple oaks that were approximately 180 years old. Um, no, they're just massive, massive oaks that aren't quite that old, but um, somewhere around that range. Pretty old. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, uh, here is one of my favorite TOS members. Uh, let's see. I walk with TOS Memphis chapter each November in the wildlife habitat area and have seen small bird houses on many trees. What birds are these intended for? So those were originally created, um, and my hopes are still this, but uh, there is a, a birding, or rather bird study, um, overwintering study and brood study that is going on at Neiman Shelby, run by the University of Memphis. I remember taking part in this when I went to University of Memphis. I remember going to look and I loved it and I wanted to include it in our park. Uh, so those birdhouses were designed previously by somebody else. I made a couple tweaks to make looking into them easier, uh, where we disturb the bird in the nest less, or nest less. But uh, they were originally designed to... Uh, attract Carolina wrens, uh, or yeah, Eastern bluebirds, uh, prothonotary warblers. Right, okay, um, let's see, more questions. What was involved in converting the golf course into a nature area? 
So there's a few ways you can do it, but we wanted to do it the most natural way possible. So that was through prescribed ferns. Um, in fact, since we're trying to keep it a natural Tennessee grassland and natural Tennessee grasslands, though they do exist naturally, they exist for a relatively short time because you get what's called um, sweet gum encroachment or you know pine encroachment. So you get a whole bunch of these trees we are currently experiencing sweet gum encroachment. So what we're supposed, what you're supposed to do with the natural Tennessee grassland is do prescribed burns every so often for the entire life of the the habitat. Um, so we haven't had a prescribed burn for about four years. We should have it at least every other year. Uh, so that is something that we will be working on to get uh, next winter. Uh, we are doing the paperwork now for the prescribed burns. Interesting. Um, does the park have programs that go into depth on the history that you opened with? We do. Uh, we offer that um, a lot. We have, and we have variations of the history that I, I talked about. Of course, sometimes we'll go further into the CCC. Uh, I'm trying to put something together where we go further into the CIC, uh, the Commission of on Interracial Cooperation, because that's something I am not, or that's what I am least familiar with as far as the information that I gave today. Uh, so I am now trying to create a program that speaks more in depth about that. So yes, we do that. If you have an interest, like I said, the contact information that I gave, you can reach out and ask for that. Um, and if we have the staff and if we have the time, because uh, we are currently short staffed and hiring, but if we have the staff and we have the time, we will put it together specifically, uh, you know, to give later on. Mm -hmm. That's great. And here's a related question. What is the update on having T.O. Fuller State Park designated as a, as a national register of historic places site? So that is something we're looking into. Um, I don't have, I know I was informed at the beginning, or I'm sorry, at the end of 2021, I was informed that we should hear something on what we need to do next by August of 2022. And that did not happen. Um, in fact, um, we had a management change in August of 2022. So that is something we're looking into. Uh, still something we're very, very interested in because that would change the funding that we would be able to have, uh, not just from the state, but from the federal government as well, and allow us to do more in our historical program. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. And as back to the grasslands, what animal species will benefit from having grassland habitat? So, of course, uh, you get a lot of little birds. Uh, the, the little brown birds is what I like to call them. I'm not very adept at identifying the little brown ones. You get a ton of them. Um, then you get uh, a lot of snake habitat and, and rodents. Now, those would bring the birds of prey when allow them to be seen um, more easily. Uh, then, of course, that they also, those smaller prey also brings out the, the coyote, the foxes, which we do have, and uh, the bobcats as well. So the point of having that natural Tennessee grassland is it allows for the, I guess, more easy viewing of some of these wildlife that would just be able to hide in burrows under tree roots, generally. Um, and it has, because the only time I've ever seen a bobcat is in the wildlife habitat area. Um, so the, yeah, that's that's one of our reasons, and one of the reasons we have the cart trails that were originally for the golf course. We repaved them, and we're keeping them because that allows you to see further into it without disturbing uh, the habitat. That's great. I'll also just mention because I like birds. It's that one of the fastest declining groups of birds in our country, anyway, is grassland birds. And so the more grassland habitat we can create, the better. Um, so it's good news for all of those little brown birds and yes. meadow larks too, meadow larks and bluebirds too. Okay, is there a Friends of Teal Fuller Park or interest in developing such a group? 
there is absolutely a friend to Teo Fuller Park. Um, and they also just had a, um, I guess management change wouldn't be the correct term, but that's what I want to say. They also just had a management change, so they are undergoing some changes as well, and they are very interested in getting new members. So what you can do is give us a call or an email um, and, and give us your information. We will reach out Dr. Col Dr. Sorry, Mr. Coleman Thompson is the gentleman that is currently the president of um, our friends group now. Uh, so we will reach out to him and then, of course, they will reach out or he will reach out to whoever is interested. Okay. Um, if you had to guess, how many Bobcats live in T.O. Fuller? Three, actually, um, at least at least three territories. Um, I don't know how many bobcats would be in a territory, but uh, based on how large the territory could be, um, we could have three. I've seen, I think I told you I saw a bobcat on two different occasions. I've seen one on three different occasions in the park. Uh, I've seen one out in the wildlife habitat area. I've seen one in the day use area, which also includes the wildlife habitat area. Um, and then I've seen one in the campground. Uh, the campground is far enough away that that could be a different um, uh, thing. <laughs> territory. There we go. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, that could be a different territory. And of course, I do believe because I've seen tracks um, on the edge of our property on Riverport near a wetland. I do believe there's another territory out there. It would be nice to uh, do some tagging and maybe some uh, wildlife. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah, we're tapping, doing tapping work. Yeah. yeah, we're doing that with ducks now, actually, with Christian Brothers University. Cool. Um, oh, and here's some basic information. How large is the park in acres? 1,283 acres. Um, woo. See, I, I'm still committing that to memory because we just got 145 acres donated to us. Uh, one of our, the initiation loop, one of the trails that I spoke to you about, the one built by Trail Trippers, was actually in response, it was built in response to us getting that particular um, 65 acre lot. Uh, now, we have another 65 acre lot that we are putting another trail on at this moment. So it's 1,283 total. Oh, great. And I must mention that Wolf River Conservancy was instrument, instrumental in getting the expansion of 144, 145 acres. To Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we also partner on educational programs. So we are part, we consider T.O. Fuller State Park one of our partners. Um, here is a really important question or, um, yeah. I understand that your new manager, Jessica Gossett, is the first African-American woman to ever be hired as a state park manager. Is that true? Probably. Um, yeah, because I, I didn't know where we were going with that at first. But yes, I actually do believe so. We have, a, a, there, we have another um, African-American female ranger who was in, con not contention for this park, but another manager so we're we're going to have another one real soon so we have uh we're very lucky to be able to see that we also have uh in area one parks which is where we're located the first um female chief ranger um hired as well so that's just cool that's just great it's just wonderful well i think we have finally uh done all the questions and thank you so much for this wonderful program and i can't wait to get back down to to fuller oh yeah i can't wait to see all y'all uh, <laughs> i want to see everybody that's watching this come down here yeah absolutely um all right well i will let you uh go relax and thank you everybody for attending and please check out our website wolfiber.org for for our programming uh come join us for martin luther king day on Monday, we'll do some service projects. So thank you very much, Dakota. Thank you. Okay, you take care. Bye-bye. Right.